Jessica, thank you so much for that. That was powerful and encouraging, so thank you. Um, good morning, Trinity. Good morning. good morning, Trinity. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as Dr. Worley already announced, my name is Emanuela. Um, I'm a second, div, second year MDiv student here, and it is truly a gift to be able to stand with you this morning. And so I just want to quickly rush to say thank you to Dr. Worley just for even the invitation. Um, it's not to be taken lightly when someone asks you to speak the word of God, and so I don't take that lightly whatsoever. I realize that um, for your chapel series, you've been going through the Songs of Ascent. And so I'm going to continue on that journey with you. Um, so today we're going to be coming from Psalm 125. And I know we don't normally do it this way here, but if you don't mind um, standing as I get ready to read God's word. So meet me in Psalm 125. Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with the evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. You may be seated. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time we get to crack open your word. I pray that as I begin to speak, you would remind me of my name, that you are with me. And Lord, I pray that you, your spirit would just speak to everyone in this room today. For I know the reason why you've given me this message, but I pray that you would cut and multiply and divide um, your word so that it can reach everyone where they are this morning. Make much of yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. So last August, I got the opportunity to go to California for the very first time, and I fell in love. Like, I loved it. I was in L.A. and San Diego, and I loved that they had the best of both worlds. They had the mountains and the oceans. They had, like, amazing food, amazing culture, just amazing entertainment. Like, I was ready to pack up my bags and move to California. Um, but there was, there's one thing, one thing about California that makes me not move there. Does anyone know what that is? Oh, somebody, I think, said it. Earthquakes. Earthquakes. You see, the entire time I was in California, in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, oh no, what if an earthquake happens while I'm here? Like, I know it sounds silly, and I was talking to one of my friends about it, and she's like, it's not that big of a deal. Earthquakes happen here all the time. We don't really feel them. You know, every once in a while, maybe a picture will fall off the wall, but it's no big deal. <laughs> and, and I just, that just, that, that never satisfied me. Like, I don't know if maybe Hollywood has gotten to me or something. I don't know. But when I imagine earthquakes, it's the thought of the very ground moving under me. And it's this whole idea because, like, earthquakes, they're unpredictable. No one knows when they're coming. They can cause a lot of pain and a lot of destruction, and often they can leave you feeling like there's nothing reliable for you to hold on to. And when I analyze my fear of earthquakes, I realize that it stems from the fact that earthquakes remind me of life. You see, life can be unpredictable. It can cause a lot of destruction and pain and ultimately leaving you feeling like there is nothing reliable that you can hold on to. Maybe you start off okay and things seem to be going well and then suddenly anxiety and depression hits you, right? Maybe you've been having the time of your life and then all of a sudden you get that phone call that someone back home is sick or has passed away. 
Life has a way of happening to you. It's unpredictable. It's painful. And it makes you wonder what you can hold on to. But the good thing is I didn't come to talk about the precariousness of life. I didn't come to talk about its troubles. I came to talk about the confidence we can have in the stability of our God. And that is what our psalm is about today. It answers the question, when everything around us is shaking up, what can we hold on to? And our psalm confidently says, we can hold on to God. And so there's four reasons outlined in our passage of why we should trust in the Lord. It says we should trust in the Lord because of his stability. Look with me at verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. It's a bold declaration and an awesome promise to those who trust in God, to those who trust he will make like a mountain, to those who trust he will make to be unmovable, to those who trust, to those who trust. Did you catch that? The promise is conditioned on something. Trust. Only those who trust in the Lord are guaranteed this unmovable stability. In fact, the whole psalm is conditioned on this. Only those who place their trust, their full dependence, not on their own ability, but on God will experience this. And there's a well-known story that highlights this point very well. It's about a famous tightrope walker named Charles Blunden. He wanted to be the first to ever tightrope across Niagara Falls. Yes, I mean that massive waterfall that separates Canada and the United States. And so when he, when he put the word out, thousands of people came to watch him. And on the summer of 1859, he stepped out onto a tightrope only two inches thick and over 200 feet above the ground with nothing but thundering water underneath him. And he began to walk across the rope. And to everyone's surprise, he made it. But he enjoyed it so much, he decided he wanted to make this a regular occurrence. So each time he went across it, he, he raised the stakes. The next time he went across, he blindfolded himself. The next time he went across, he rode a bicycle across. I mean, he started to do some of the most amazing things on this tightrope. But the story is com as the story is commonly told, one time he went across the tightrope with a wheelbarrow holding a sack of potatoes. And when he got to the end, he yelled down to the crowd, do you believe I can actually push someone in this wheelbarrow across the tightrope? And everyone said, yes, we, we believe you can. We've seen what you've done. And he's like, great. Who, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? And of course, nobody did. You see, it's one thing to say you believe he can do it. It's another thing to trust him with your life to do it. Surprisingly, a month later, though, he convinced his manager to hop on his back as he carried him across the tightrope. But he gave him very clear instructions. He said, until I clear this place, be a part of me, mind, body, and soul. If I sway, sway with me. Don't attempt to do any balancing yourself or we will both fall. That is dependence. It is more than just mere belief. It's when we piggyback on God, when we trust him with our life. We aren't trying to balance ourselves. You aren't trying to rely on your own ability or performance or anything else. Instead, you let God carry you through the troubles of life. And so I don't want to make light of this because I realize that trust is difficult. I struggle with this all the time. It does not come easy. Rather, it is a supernatural work done in tandem with the Holy Spirit. And yet, though it is not easy, it is required. And when we do this, God doesn't leave us teetering on a tightrope. The psalmist says that God promises to make us stable. He says those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. Now, Mount Zion, as we know, is another name for Jerusalem. It is the mountain on which the city rested. 
As the Israelites were on their pilgrimage up to Jerusalem to worship, they could see Mount Zion in the distance. And as they observed the mountain, it became an object lesson. For they realized, wow, this mountain is firm. It is fixed. There's absolutely nothing that can move it. No wind, no storm, nothing. And that is what God is promising to us that he will make us stable like Mount Zion, that no storm of life, no wind of trial will be able to move us. But I see that did almost absolutely nothing to most of you. And it's probably because you're a lot like me. You don't feel stable. You don't feel like you can't be moved. Because the reality is we're moved all the time. Worry, anxiety, finances, our weight, our relationships, or lack thereof, our roommates, our spouse, our politics, the news, our likes or comments on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I mean, sometimes even the weather can move us. So how is it that this text can make such a bold claim? And the promise of this passage, however, relies on faith. The promise of stability doesn't come on how you feel. It comes on the truth of who God is. Sometimes you will not feel like it, but you have to make the decision that I will trust the Lord despite my feelings. I will trust the Lord despite my circumstances. I will trust the Lord despite my uncertainty because when you do, he will give you the ability. He will give you the power to endure. He will give you the sanity and whatever you need to make it through the storm. When the earthquakes of life hit, when you are teetering that tightrope, God can make you stable. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They cannot be moved. The second reason we trust in the Lord is because he promises protection, which is outlined in verses 2 and 3. So starting in verse 2, he says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. You see, Mount Zion was not the tallest mountain in Jerusalem. What made it so stable and fortified of a city is not because it itself was a mountain, but rather it was surrounded by other mountains. And these mountains were much taller than Mount Zion and were used as Israel's defense against their enemies. And so this is exactly what God is promising to us, that he will not only make us stable, but that he himself will surround us. See, when we trust in the Lord, he will make you stable. But when you trust in the Lord, he himself will come to protect you. And it makes me think of the story of Elisha. Uh, the king of Syria, uh, being upset with Elisha, decided that he wanted to take him captive. And so one morning, Elisha woke up to find that an enemy army had been surrounded or, uh, around him. And Elisha's servant was panicked. He was like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And Elisha, as bold as ever, was like, oh, don't worry. Those who are for us are more than those who are against us. And the servant was looking at him like, what? I don't see anybody. And Elisha was like, that's cool. I'm going to pray. So he prayed and he asked the Lord, will you please open my servant's eyes so that he can see? And when the servant opened his eyes, he saw that all around them there was horses and chariots of fires from God who was there to protect them. That is the picture of God surrounding his people. But there's another aspect to God's protection that I don't want us to miss, and that is there is presence to God's protection. You see, there was a four-year-old boy who was in the pool with his father. He wasn't able to stand up on his own yet because the water was too deep, so the father was holding him in the shallow end, and the boy was having the time of his life. And then slowly the father began to walk towards the deep end, and as the water began to go from the boy's feet, to his knees, to his waist, to his shoulders, varying degrees of panic came over his face and he began to cling more tightly to his father. But if the boy could have analyzed his situation, he would have realized there was no need for panic or worry. His father could easily touch the ground. Even though the water's depth at any part of the pool was over his head, he was fortress in the arms of his father who wasn't going to let him go. And what I'm saying is that when the waters of our life begin to rise, 
When our troubles go from our knees to our waist to our shoulders, and we begin to worry and stress and panic, we need to take a moment, analyze our situation, and realize that God is not out of his depth. That when we cling to the Father just like this little child, we realize we are a fortress in the arms of the Father, and he will not let us go. We're safe even when we're going deeper than we've ever been. But being in the arms of God does not mean you will be free from trouble. God allows some troubles and trials into our life. In fact, they are inevitable and should be expected. But while we are not safe from problems, we can be safe in our problems, which is what is happening in verse 3. It says, For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Now, I know at first glance that's a lot of information, a lot to take in, but what the psalmist is saying is that evil will not be allowed to reign over God's people forever. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, While those who trust in the Lord will abide forever, their problems won't. And this is good news this morning, because when we look all over our world, there's trouble all around us. The psalmist was not naive. Whomever penned this song knew we wouldn't get the luxury of trusting the Lord under perfect conditions. Rather, we would have to learn to trust him in the face of an evil and wicked world. Israel was no stranger to trouble. In fact, many scholars believe this psalm was written after their time in exile. If that was the case, Israel had seen Jerusalem conquered. They had seen their temple robbed. They had seen people murdered and taken into captivity. And now, even though they were back in their land, the scepter of wickedness was on it. That means they were still being ruled by foreign powers. But foreign rule is not just limited to the ancient context because the reality is we too live under the reign of evil right now. The circumstances in our country and in our world make it appear as though evil has the upper hand. I mean, think about it. Mass shootings in New Zealand, Orlando, Las Vegas, California, plane crashes in Ethiopia, racial unrest, violence against women, murder of unarmed uh, civilians, and the recurring lack of justice. These things make it appear that evil is winning and can add to our anxiety, our worry, and even our pain. But in spite of all this, why should our confidence not be shaken? Because the scepter of wickedness will not be allowed to rest on the land. In other words, God will not allow evil to win forever. Our troubles are only temporary, and this is hope. Because as Eugene Peterson says, we do not have to whistle in the dark, hoping that we can forget our sense of insecurity, hoping that our fears will subside. But we can face real darkness of life and put our insecurities in their proper place. That they are not allowed to reign over us forever. So I'm here to tell you, speak to your problems. Say to them, you are not allowed to reign here forever. Speak to depression and say, you are not allowed to reign here forever. Speak to dysfunction and say, you are not allowed to reign here forever because there is a God who reigns and his name is Jesus and he has won the victory and he does not give back anything that he has won to himself. And even though we cannot see it, even though sometimes it does not make sense, he is somehow working out all of these troubles in our life for our good so that way no persecution or famine or nakedness or sword, no anything in this life can separate us, cancel out, or violate what God is going to do for his people. For we are fortressed in the arms of the Father. He will protect us and he will not let evil reign over us. The third reason we trust in the Lord is because he will help us. Look at uh, verse 4. The psalmist says, do good, O Lord, to those are, who are good and upright in heart. What do you do when you're waiting for the promises of God? You pray. 
Because sometimes our situations don't line up with his promises. So we should pray about it. Just because God promises doesn't mean that we don't take it to him and say, Lord, let your will be done here. And so that's what the psalmist is doing. He switches from confidence in the promise of God to the confidence in prayer. And it truly is a gift that no matter what we're going through, we can come to the Lord and ask him directly for what we need. We don't have to wait in line. We don't have to make an appointment. But we can walk in boldly into his throne room at any point and present our requests to him. And in fact, switching from promises to prayer is not by any means a lack of confidence. It's quite the contrary. It's because we trust that we must pray. I know sometimes we pray out of fear, right? Like sometimes we pray to God in such a way that we project our own insecurities onto his ability. We say, Lord, are you sure you will make me secure because I don't feel secure? Or we say, are you sure you're not going to let evil win because it looks like it's winning? But that's not what the psalmist is doing here. This is a prayer of confidence that the Lord will help, that he will do what he said he will do. So he says, Lord, do good to those who are good. And the question is then, who is the good? Like, who can really pray with like that? Are we the good? Those who are good in this passage is referring to those who trust. And I know I keep saying it over and over and over and over because that's the key to everything that I'm talking about. Those who are good and upright in heart are those who have pledged their allegiance to God. They have trusted on him for their salvation and they are trusting him now for his protection. They are those who stand steady in every change of circumstance. And like Job, they're not cursing God when they find themselves in trials, but they're believing that everything that God ordains is best and that he's working it out. And so they align themselves to his will. They are faithful to God and cry out to him, do good, even though I don't know what that's going to look like for me. Do good, O Lord, even if my problem doesn't work out the way that I want it to. Do good, O Lord. And this is contrasted with those who do evil, who fall away and reject God because of their circumstances. To them, they can only expect judgment. But to those who are good, they can trust that God will do them good in time. They can pray like the psalmist in Psalm 27, though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me up upon the rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord because I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Those who trust in the Lord will receive his help and his goodness. And then finally, those who trust in the Lord will have peace. The psalmist closes by saying, peace be on Israel. It's a benediction. It's like when a pastor stretches out his hands over the congregation and aware of all of the burdens, fears, and hopes of the people, he says, peace be upon you. And isn't that what we need? the peace that passes all understanding, the peace of God that can guard our weary hearts and our tired minds despite what burdens and trials we may carry? Because that's what God wants to give us. Trials, challenges, and hardships of life seem to always make, take something from us. But God wants to give us something. He wants to give us peace. Not like the world gives peace which is empty and unstable. But he wants to give us eternal peace because he is the only one who can keep his word. You see, we trust in the Lord because he grants stability. We trust in the Lord because he provides protection. We trust in the Lord because he gives us his help and his goodness, and we trust in the Lord because he gives us peace. 
But if nothing I said to you this morning brought you any hope, then look to Jesus. Because just like us, he walked in trials and troubles and tribulations. He experienced fear and anxiety and pain and suffering. And then he brought them to the cross. And when it looked like the situation was over, that evil had won, that his circumstances had overtaken him, that there was nothing else we could rely on and trust in, he rose again from the grave. And we realize that because of that, we have hope. It's because of that we can look at every single circumstance and every trial and every struggle through that lens of hope because Christ on the cross was purchasing our peace. He was purchasing our stability. He was purchasing everything that we need so we can walk through this life because he had conquered it for us. And so this morning, all I want to remind you of is trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with your lives. Trust in the Lord with your situations, your burdens, your worries, your cares. Trust in the Lord and let him carry you. Amen.